Hey guys, Mike Roberts, the Converse Cowboy Podcast. Sat down with Chris Peterson today up in Utah. He is a musician, singer, songwriter, artist, and uh, photographer. Doing a number of cool things. Um, he's got a new album coming out, um, Cowboy Coming Home. Um, but above all, he's just a genuine guy. And um, y'all check him out at Die Hard Cowboy on Instagram and uh, listen to the show. Let us know what you think. Man, we'll just roll into it. And it's just going to be a conversation, you know. I don't, want, right. I don't want it to feel like an interview or anything like that. Of course, I want to have some questions I want to get to, but um, I really just want it to be a conversation, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, top of mind right now is how everything's changed, you know, in these weird times that we're in, COVID nineteen, with the coronavirus, and I guess how that's affected what you have going on. You know, I'm sure our, I'm sure all tours have been canceled. Um, how does that affect your day to day? Yeah, the, the the music part of it's uh, a little bit rough. I mean, pretty much all your shows are canceled, and Jeez. It, it it sucks. But um, we're we're doing all right. We're finding other productive things to do, like writing new songs and working on the show. Um, just trying to fine tune little things. It's actually that part of it's good. We get to sit back and reflect and figure out how can we get better. So we're just trying to make the most of every moment no matter what it is um and right now it's just we can't we can't be out there doing shows so it's stay home and fine-tune your game yeah yeah i think that's the only way to look at it at least from my mindset you know i guess you have two different choices you can sit there and feel sorry for yourself and the rest of the world or you can get still and like you said reflect on what's going on and really you know take the time to do dive into maybe something new or for, for somebody like you maybe dive into some new songwriting yeah what um um i'm curious to know how that works and i'm trying not to ask the generic bullshit questions but around <laughs> songwriting you know I'm, I'm so curious as to how that how that process goes for you I, I i i play so i play the guitar and i hesitate to say that like i know some chords on the the guitar and i can strum some songs but i would not call myself a guitar player um but I've tried writing some stuff here and there and it's very, it's not very easy um, for me, but I'm curious to know your process. You know, do you sit down, do you write lyrics first? Do you sit down, do you write the music first? How, how does that process look for you? Honestly, for me, there's no specific formula. It can happen in a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's the majority of the time I would say though, it's I'm going about my day and, a thought will pop into my head, which is maybe a line, one line. And if I like it, I, I'll, I keep a note, a notepad. Well, it used to be a notepad. Now it's more of notes on my phone, but I'll just write it down. Uh, anything I like, I write down anything and everything. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll come up with an idea and I don't know what to do with it right now, but a year from now I'm scrolling through my notes and I'll find that one line. And, and I'm just that day. It just makes sense to me. And, uh, I start writing from there. Um, that, that's one way it happens. Um, another way is just the grind on my album. I, I really got into this, uh, making it happen thing. Sometimes it comes to you natural, but other times you just got to sit down and work. And one of the things I found to be really, uh, productive for me is just to take an hour every morning. I get up, do my, do my thing. And then for an hour, I make myself come up with ideas and I write down everything. So you know, every morning I'll have 10 to 20 ideas that I think, okay, this could be a song and I just write it down, just write. And it's just a, it's one of those things, you know, if, if you do it enough and you have 3000 ideas, 10 of them are bound to be pretty good yeah. and they'll work out. Um, th that's, that's one of the ways I start. Um, there's a whole lot of other things that help that. Um, Sometimes I'll, I'll come up with a melody or something in my head and then you got to find words that fit that. Yeah. But another thing for me, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, but another thing Man, for me. Get as deep as you can. Another thing for me that's been super, super helpful is, you know, one person only has so much power. There's, there's so much power that comes from adding an, another perspective. And so one of the things that I've, I've found that, really helps me is I'll come up with an idea and I'll 
it's like building a house. I'll build this blueprint of, okay, this is the title. This is what I want the song to be about. This is where I feel like the first, the story that I want the first verse to tell. Um, this is what the second verse should say. What's the overall song supposed to mean to somebody? And then I'll go and I'll take all that. And I've, I've done a lot of writing with my producer, Trent Wilman. Mm -hmm. And we've just, we've done very well together and it's basically I'll take that blueprint to him and together we'll, we'll just break out that song in a couple hours. And that, that to me has been so productive to just take somebody. If you want to be something, find somebody that's a master at it yeah, and work with them and learn from them. And that's, that's what I've tried to do. Um, Trent's a master at it. And I mean, I've, I've written a lot of songs on my own, but, I feel like I'm way more productive when I team up with somebody who is, has a, can bring a different set of strengths. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, yeah, I'm a firm believer in, in having mentors and surrounding ourselves with those people just because they can't expedite that learning process or, and bring another flavor or something, you know, to the table. I'm curious to know though, how did you, how did you get in touch with Trent and how did that, how did that relationship form? <laughs> so, Honest, honest truth, how I got in touch with Trent from the, uh, at the first, hold on. Can you still see me? Yeah, I got you now. You disappeared for a minute. My phone's trying to die on me. I'm just making sure it's Yeah, it's me. all good. So, I, I think uh, in everything I, I do, like, or anybody does, you find a goal and you find something you want to work toward, and... And you go after it and figure out how to make it happen. For me, working with Trent Wilman was a dream, to be honest. Um, he had some songs that I loved. I knew he was a super talented songwriter. I knew he had produced um, people like Cody Johnson. And so I, I found people that I wanted to be like. And I said, okay, how am I going to get there? And then then you make a plan. Well, my plan was I'm going to I'm going to have – get in contact with Trent Wilman somehow and see if he will be my producer and, and help me out and ended up uh, through in a roundabout way we ended up uh, my girlfriend actually contacted him and and we were planning a show and she actually asked him to come perform and so I was able to meet him through that uh, oh, right on through, through that connection and we started talking over the summer and uh, just, you know, decided to write, write a couple songs and see how it worked out. And so we started writing and the first day, it was amazing. Uh, it went better than I could have ever imagined. First day we wrote two songs. The next day we wrote another song and that was a weekend. And then scheduled another trip and went back out two days. We wrote four songs and just, became really good friends after that we had a lot in common as far as hunting and horses and um had a lot of the same views on music mm -hmm. we're, we're both we're both more into traditional-ish country music yeah know, cowboy country and so our vision aligned really well and we both felt like it was a great fit so after we'd written five or six songs together i asked him if he'd produce my album and he agreed and so we we just uh, been going since then. Yeah, right on. I was um, I was reading your bio and uh, I saw the name Trent Wilman. I'm like, God, where do I know that name from? And then I was like, Oh yeah, I don't know. Some years back, Chris, I remember hearing a song called "The Rope and Pin." Yeah, and I was like, That's where I know that name from. But after yeah. listening to your stuff and listening to his stuff, I was like, Oh, I get it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, it was it was a perfect fit. I'd, I'd written a song called rodeo road and it's one of my favorites and uh i just feel like our, our styles matched up really well yeah yeah man you uh you mentioned um something about writing stuff down um you know whether it be in a notebook or whatever it is there was a line that i it really stuck out to me if you could take a look inside the dashboard of my soul yeah where'd that come from so that's one of those things it was a line that I went into a songwriting session with Trent and that was one of the things that I was, that was kicking around in my mind was, 
you know, there's a lot of people around that, that claim to be, claim to be cowboys or this or that. And, uh, really it's only what's inside of you that determines that there's, there's a lot of people out there who will say, well, you can't be a cowboy because you don't do this or you don't do that, or you don't have 500 head of cows. And to me, it's, it's more what's inside that makes you cowboy. And, uh, mm. that was one of the ideas that was really kicking around in my head and, you know, wearing out boots and putting miles on the ground and miles on your soul. That's what makes you who you are over time. And just, just nobody, nobody can see what you've been through personally. Nobody can see inside your, inside your soul and your own path. I can look at this guy over here and say, well, he, he's, he's not a cowboy. He can't ride a horse, but I can't see inside of his soul. And I don't know, I don't know anything about him really. Yeah. So that, that was kind of where it came from was, was that whole, because you can't judge somebody from the outside there's just a whole lot going on underneath and yeah kind of a a lot of deep thoughts that morphed into that line yeah it's definitely deep man it 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 stuck with me for sure um (laughs) what about so you talk about um collaborating on these songs how does that work what does that process look like um you know having somebody else in that room is it like you write a line he writes a line do you write a whole song he writes a whole song and you pick out what's best no, so it's it's exactly what it sounds like, collaboration. So you basically, I'll, I'll bring a blueprint of a song and, and from there we just start putting nails in, right? You're building a house together. And it's not like somebody is saying, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. It's you both just start throwing out lines and throwing out ideas and together you pick what's best. Cause you both know, well, whoever's working on the project knows and if you're honest. And, and that's what goes into like having having a good fit in someone that you're riding with. Mm. A lot of times, I feel like people could get a power trip, or they're like, "Oh, I want this," or they have to have it their way. And and I feel like to have a good, healthy collaboration, you can't do that. You can't be selfish. You have to go in and say, "Okay, what is the best idea? What is the best solution to this problem?" And together, you just hammer out ideas and ideas and ideas, and it just can't have any pride involved it's you take the best ideas and yep so we'll just both sit there with with i'll sit there with a pad and paper and my guitar and he'll sit there and the same thing and he's very talented on the music creation part of it and uh so it's just one of those things you just work together and work until it's done yeah i read uh, throw out ideas and kind of go we usually go line by line and um okay let's work on this next line and then we we both start spitting out ideas and okay i like that what about this what about that and you just keep modifying it as it goes yeah i read uh guy clark's um biography um i don't know a couple years ago and he talks about half the battle is just showing up you know, yeah. just going to the studio every day. I think his time was like 10 o'clock and he would go in and he's like, man, that's just half the battle. Just show up. Yeah. But, um, what about some of those songs, Trent, that maybe you've written that you've never recorded? I'm wondering how many of those are sitting in a notebook somewhere that, that nobody's ever heard before. As far as ideas, man, I've, there's hundreds of them. Uh, yeah. when, when I go to Nashville to write, or if I sit down at home and write, I'll basically just bust out. I've got old folders just full of, full of papers with lines and lyrics and ideas. And some, sometimes they don't even make sense to me anymore. I'll look at it and I'll be like, I don't know what I was thinking that day, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. sometimes some of my favorite songs though, come from that. I'll, I'll go back. I mean, two years and I'll read a line and I'm in that day. I'm just like, I like that. Let's run with it. And, uh, turns into be turns out to be one of my favorite songs so yeah yeah i forget who was it that said that um write drunk ed, edit sober <laughs> you ever take that approach <laughs> no no i actually yeah i i don't personally but <laughs> i can see how it would help sometimes i've written really tired yeah <laughs> i got you I know that was, uh, I think it was Steve Earl, you know, I was back in his, the heydays of Copperhead Road and all that stuff. And he was all hopped up on whatever he was taking. And 
he got clean and that was his biggest fear was he wasn't going to be able to ride anymore interesting concept to me there's like there's different ways to you've got to get in the right mindset and a lot of guys this isn't my personal style but i know it works for a lot of people but they'll 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 alter their state of mind Mm -hmm. and whether that's from drinking or whatever they'll they'll a lot of guys will do that um for me it's more yes i'm going to alter my state of mind but it's going to be through some uh natural form like maybe i'll go up on top of the mountain and i've i've written songs on top of the mountain before i'll sit i'll just sit down on a rock uh overlooking the canyon and start writing what comes to mind and uh you know it's just about changing your environment changing your perspective and and sometimes it's just some crazy off the wild wall idea that comes to you and you just got to write it down yeah yeah that's interesting um have you ever done like the week long in a cabin or for a month or anything like that to... um not the week no i i usually do a weekend um yeah. so you know three days i, yeah. I got to hold down a job so i don't get to do that too often <laughs> <laughs> i got you what do you do uh, what do you do chris outside of playing music outside of music and the cowboy photography thing i i actually do graphic design and video production right on and uh yeah just i've been doing that for several years so is that um it, that i gotta think that's part of die hard cowboy is that uh, what that yeah. is so Die Hard Cowboy, basically, I've always had a passion for um, imagery. So I started out actually in Western and wildlife art. I would draw pictures, and there was a while there I thought I was going to do that for a living. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time. It would take me a week to finish a drawing, and I'd turn around and try to sell it. But at that point, I was so connected to the drawing. I'm like, I don't even want to sell this. I've spent so much time on this. And uh, so I, I gradually moved away from that and I got into video production and photography and I came back to building art basically through photography because you essentially do the same thing. You, you see an image or you see something in your mind and you go create it only with photography. It's a few seconds and I can create an image, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was just a, a lot faster turnaround. It was the same idea where I get to create. Um, and so I started doing Die Hard Cowboy basically came from my love of horses and the Western lifestyle and culture. And I wanted to share that with people who maybe didn't have access to that or, you know, they weren't born into it, but show them a glimpse of what that Western lifestyle is all about. So I started just taking pictures of horses. And when I was out, if I was out riding, um, I would take pictures of everything that was going on and just share them with the world. So that's yeah. kind of where the Die Hard Cowboy thing started. When was that? How long ago did you start that? Oh, I think it's been, I started doing the, the like selling photography probably close to 10 years ago. And I started out going down to the National Finals Rodeo and I had a booth down there and I would sell prints and just over time I've, I've gradually moved away from that and more into the social media. I've been doing the Instagram thing for probably six years. Um, doing it well too, by the way. Well, I've had fun doing it. It's just one of those things. Try to, like I said, try to share a little bit of the things that I love with other people who maybe don't have that chance. Yeah. 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 It was cool to check all of that stuff out. And I mean, shit over a hundred thousand something followers. Um, that's impressive. There's a lot of folks out there. You know, everybody wants to be cowboy, right? And and like you said, yeah. maybe not everybody has access to horses or whatnot. So yeah. that uh, that's really cool what you're doing. Let's. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. Talk about you know some of the performances and maybe some of the struggles you faced early on. You know, with overcoming fears, resistance, whatever it may be, of of uh, actually climbing on the stage and and doing your first show. Yeah. So. There was a lot, a lot of fear in the beginning. My, my whole life growing up, I was extremely um, quiet, reserved, and 
there wasn't a chance I was going to stand on the stage and sing in front of anybody. I wasn't even going to stand in the bathroom, <laughs> in the shower, if anybody else was in the house and sing. If anybody yeah. could hear me, I wasn't singing. I was just, <laughs> I didn't even like to talk in front of people. And, I mean, even today, that's not my strong suit. Um, so getting on stage just terrified me. And I, there wasn't a chance I was going to do it. Uh, growing up, my dad was a, my dad was a singer. And it was the last thing I was going to do. That was my dad's thing. And he has a totally different style than me. He has more of an operatic style. And uh, in my mind, I, didn't, I couldn't sing. I was like, I can't sing like that. And so I just didn't do it. But I always had lines and lyrics in my head. And I, was always, I, would, I would always sing to myself and be writing songs. And, but I was just afraid to do it. And the the desire to do it at, at some point just got stronger than my fear basically mm. I, I had a group of friends that put me in the right environment made me feel more comfortable uh several of them were really good at the guitar and so we'd sit around at night and they would just play a, a melody or just play chords and i would sing i'd make up lyrics on the fly mm. we'd just play games like all right we're gonna go around in a circle and you take turns right in the line and we did that all the time and I realized I just I loved it and it, it was just something I wanted to do more and the more I did it the more I wanted to do it and so we had this group of you know six people and I got comfortable singing in front of them and I had written down lyrics over the years and I wanted to write a song and how old were you at this time Chris <laughs> I don't know how old I was but but it was I was probably mid 20s honestly okay I don't know exact an exact age but mid 20s and I was still not gonna do it <laughs> so one day I went to one of my friends and I, I just said hey I've got all these lyrics I want to write this song uh will you help me write it and she's like yeah sing it to me I'm like no nope. <laughs> not gonna do it because because basically the song was like my inner thoughts and feelings and there was vulnerability there and I didn't sure. want that. And, uh, I'm like, I just told her, no, I'm not going to do it. So about a week went by and finally, like I said, you, you come to a point where your desire to accomplish something becomes stronger than your fear. Mm -hmm. And so I went back over and I just said, Hey, I'm ready to write that song. Let's write it. And so I sang it to her and she, she busted out some chords and, I wrote this first song. Well, the thing I didn't expect was she was going to make me sing that song everywhere we went for the next year, basically. So we just had this real close group of friends. And every time we went anywhere, they would peer pressure me and say, Chris is going to sing a song. The first couple of <laughs> times, I was like, no, I'm not. And then they'd, start, they'd start, you know, playing the guitar. And finally, I broke down and started singing it. And I did it in front of four people and then 10 people and then 15 people. And pretty soon I was okay with the idea and, and it got easier. And then there came did you, at point. that time though, did you realize your talent? Did you realize you had this ability to sing? And uh, I don't know that I realized I had this a talent or a, an ability, but I enjoyed it. Uh -huh. um, I loved writing songs and creating and singing. But it was something that it really it really took time to develop and for me to say, you know what, this is what I want to do. And um, let's see, it, it probably took another year. I started really uh, working on the writing on the guitar and writing new songs. I wrote a couple more songs and pretty soon I had enough songs to write an album or to produce an album. So were you, I'm curious know. to know, were you playing at the, were you playing the guitar at this point? Yeah. So I was okay. playing the guitar and, uh, I did, I just started writing songs, but I had all these songs and I, I just didn't know what to do with them. And so one day I just get this idea in my head that, well, I'm just going to make a CD. I don't, I don't care if anybody else hears it, but I've written all these songs. So I want to, I want to record it. And a lot of the songs were very like simple, you know, they were, they were simple and they were, but they were my songs, and so I wanted them. And so uh, I knew a guy that had a recording studio. He was actually my, my dad's, 
he would do all my dad's recordings when I was a kid. And so I found his number and I called him and I said, Hey, I don't know if you remember me. My dad used to record with you. And he said, Oh yeah, for, for sure. And I said, well, I, I want to come record some songs. And he agreed to it. And so I showed up and sang through all my songs and we put them down and I released this first album and I had still never been on stage in front of anyone. I released the whole <laughs> album and, and uh, I was still afraid to sing in front of people. And, and then it's funny how life pushes you in the direction you're supposed to go. And if you're willing to take a step forward and just trust, usually things turn out a lot better than you would expect and you'll end up where you're supposed to go. So my, my dad had a copy of a, a burn CD with some of my songs on it. And this was before I actually released my first album, but he had a, a bunch of the songs that I had recorded on a burnt CD and he gave it to one of his friends who was a friend of Colin Ray. And he played it for Colin Ray and Colin Ray of course said, I want him to open my next show, which was in my hometown. And so they called me back and said, Hey, are you willing to open up for Colin Ray in front of your hometown? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Of course, of course, it's one of those things I saw I knew I had to do it. There was no option of me not doing it because I thought this, this is where I want to go. And now I have an opportunity. It doesn't matter how afraid I am. I have to do it. Yeah. So I practiced my guts out. I remember I'd sit in the dark with just me and my guitar and I'd play my song a hundred times straight in a row, just the lights off. And I got to where I, I was comfortable playing the song you know, with the lights off, can't see my hands. So you, you take away all the, all the things that can mess you up and you force yourself to overcome. Yeah. And so the day came and I was scared to death. <laughs> I, I, I think I, my mouth, I just got caught in mouth. My mouth was dry and I drank like eight gallons of water. Yeah. They, they called me out on stage. I go out there and I was so nervous and I start singing and I started, I, I could hear myself singing. And, and after like, the first line, I'm like, I sound pretty good. I can do this. And, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and right then my voice kind of cracked because I got emotional. I'm like, I'm actually doing this. And so That's cool, man. If, if anybody ever goes back and sees that video, you can kind of hear my voice get a little emotional at that point. And yeah. it, it wasn't because I was nervous. It was because I was in my mind, I'm like, I'm, I'm actually doing this. Yeah. And it was such a sense of accomplishment. And I, I made it through the song and everybody stood up and they cheered me on. And, and it was very, a very supportive environment. You know, you think of your hometown as being very judgmental, right. but it was actually the opposite. They basically embraced it and they supported me in it. And so after I talked to Colin Ray and he was very complimentary, um, he just said, you know, I think you could have a, a career in this. And he also, another thing he also said was right now, this was back in the bro country phase. And he said, right now, country's in a weird spot. <laughs> we've gone away from lyrics and we've gone away from the meaning of songs. And what you have is feeling in your songs and lyrics. And what, what he told me was, I, he said, I think that's going to come back. People are going to get tired of the bro country. They're going to get tired of the same old thing. And they're going to come back to lyrics and what music was meant to be. Mm. So and he just encouraged me. He said, keep going, keep doing it. I think there's going to be something special for you if you keep after it. So at that point, I, I, in my mind, I was just, yeah, I'm going to do it no matter what it takes. And so I went home. I found people to be in a band. And I forced myself for the next year once a week I would sing there was a local bar that had an open mic night and I forced myself once a week to sing and if there were three people at the bar three drunks you know the first time I went I was scared to death I was nervous yeah I was out there playing my guitar singing for three drunks well after about 10 times I realized they don't really care if I screw up <laughs> so, <laughs> gradually I got over that fear and yeah. I just kept going and singing for bigger and bigger crowds and and at a certain point you just get to where 
for, for me anyway, I got to a point where I enjoyed it so much and it was a, it was just a rush to be on stage and the fear basically subsided and, and I feed off of that adrenaline rush and it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. It's uh, nothing like it. I saw a quote the other day. It said, everything's scary until it's not. Yeah, it's the truth. Kind of the same thing, right? I mean, the more you exactly. do something, the, the more you do something consistently, the more, the more confidence you're going to have. But I think it's important, man. Like everybody has struggles. Everybody has, has fears or challenges in some way, whatever that may be. And, um, man, that's just a, that's a cool story, um, of you getting up and doing that. And then you're right. Yeah. The, the way timing, everything happens just as it's supposed to, you know, Colin Ray asked you to do that at the right time and in your career. And, um, and, and, you, and you have a choice as everybody does to either step up and do it and move forward and grow, or you, you just go sit on the sidelines, you know? Yep. But, um, that's cool, man. So from there, um, you go on and you're doing your thing and I'm sure there's, it's not as with anything, there's no linear path. It's not like you did that one show and, and then went on to start them. You know, it's a roller coaster. I'm curious to know what you do, Chris, whenever you do get unclear or unfocused, um, whether it be songwriting or whether it be on life on the road, how do you kind of realign? How do you, how do you find your center again? So my, my reset, uh, has always come through horses. So if I need a reset, I need to really get my mind straight and, and come back to earth. I'll go ride my horses. I'll go up in the mountains and uh, just disappear usually by myself and just be alone and think. And usually that brings me back to a point of focus. So that's what I do. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, why do, I'm curious, though. Why do you think that is, though? What is it about getting on the back of a horse and going riding that, that does it? It's almost like meditation in a way. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's something to it. Um, and I believe – this is kind of a weird thought, but I believe there's, there's something with – there's something with music, but there's also something with horses and animals where it's a totally different language. and like music, um, you, you can feel music, right? Mm -hmm. You can connect with somebody from playing music or you hear a song and it, it hits you and you don't know why. Well, I, I feel like it's the same with animals and, and especially horses for me. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's some kind of a connection. And ever since I was a kid, I was just drawn to horses and, and how they made me feel. They're, they're just you know, I've heard it said that they're a mirror, but I feel like that's, there, there's so much truth to that. If you approach them in a soft, calm way, more than likely they're going to react to you the same way. Hmm. And you can just look in their eye and, and I don't know, there's just peace there for some reason. Yeah. I, I can't explain it, Yeah. but, but it's there. There's some kind of a force. I feel like that with the whole horse therapy thing. I can't explain it, but I can tell you that there are people who, who have mental struggles or physical struggles and they get on or around horses and it changes immediately. But cool. I, I can't tell you why. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember, do you remember the first horse you ever had? I do. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story, but yeah, let's hear it. So growing up, uh, I, I didn't have a horse when I was young. But it, it was the only thing I wanted. I loved horses. And my grandpa had horses. Neighbors had horses. And I would ride as much as I, I could. I'd go over to my grandpa's. And I remember he had one pasture that he would lease out to a guy that had like 40 head of horses. And I would go down there as a little kid. And I would just walk through this giant herd of horses. And I just loved it. And I would, you know, walk up to him. And after a while, it was just this desire I just wanted my own horse and the neighbor lady would come over and take me on rides when I was just tiny um I remember when I was probably usually you don't remember things when you're three but I remember my grandpa had a buckskin horse and he brought it into our backyard and I remember my grandpa sitting me down on that horse and I I, I had to have been about three or four years old and I still remember that and so ever since then ever since I can remember I just all I wanted was my own horse and I'd beg my parents and, and 
they weren't about it. My my dad rodeoed when he was in younger and he grew up on a dairy farm and as soon as he was old enough to get away from the farm he did and so they didn't really want me to have a horse and about the time I was 11 I saw this uh well it was actually one of our neighbors said hey the four, local 4-H in this breeding barn is giving away a colt and all you have to do is ride an essay to enter and I think Chris should do it well so I I heard about it I went to my dad and I said, I, I want to do this. I, I want to try to win this horse. And he reluctantly said, all right, let's do it. And uh, he actually helped me, helped me write the essay a little bit. But I just, I wrote why, the essay was, why should you have this horse? Why should you win a horse? And so, of course, in the most sincere way, because that's all I wanted. And I, I wrote this essay called all the idols that I had at the point I was friends with all the old cowboys in town and my mm. dad would take me over to talk to him and I'd show him my little toy horse collection and <laughs> there was an old guy named Spike Makeham and he was the horseman everybody knew him everybody would go to him for horse advice and he lived he was probably a quarter mile down the street from us and I'd I'd walk there when I was a kid and I'd show him my toy horses and he'd sit there and tell me what breed they all were and tell me about them and I just lived for those moments and to, to see the knowledge that he had. I think he was about, he was 77 when I first started going over there. And uh, I just became friends with all those old guys and they'd kind of take me under their wing. And so when I was writing this essay, we just called, called these people and, and I said, okay, what does it take to take care of a horse? And so they told me everything they knew about, about what they thought I should know to prove that I could take care of a horse. And so I put all that into my essay, how much I, I'd need to feed them, how much I, what, how I would do everything, you know? Yeah. And submitted it. I ended up winning this horse. <laughs> <laughs> so I won, won, my first, won my first horse when I was 11. And honestly, at that point, they were just, they were happy to see me have a horse. Like, they were very supportive in it. Um, and they helped me as much as they could. So I, I, one of the requirements was you had to do horse 4-H for two years and show the horse. And it was just a yearling when I got it. So, of course, it was the whole process of um, showing. And, and it was a halter class at first. And then um, one of these guys that had taken me under their wing, his name was Max Gines. And he helped me train my first horse. And I fell in love with starting horses. And, and that's – Man, I just saw you. We, we took this animal that was kind of crazy, and it, well, that one was half Arabian, so it was super crazy. And, <laughs> and I, I realized that why they gave it away. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, it was a little wild. Half half quarter horse, half Arabian, so it had a wild streak. And but. Max was super, super good at uh, training these horses that were a little bit high strung mm. and making solid mountain horses out of them that weren't scared of anything. And I watched that transformation and he, he, instead of just training that horse for me, he took me and I basically had to do a lot of it and he would just tell me what to do and coach me. And that's, I think, a huge part of learning is you find someone who knows how to do what you're trying to do. And if they're willing to help you, you just listen to everything they say and yeah. spend as much time as possible and that's what I did and I just fell in love with it and so after that first horse it was just one after the other I just kept kept doing it and trying to learn it was just there and and that's what I find even today there's always always something to learn you're mm -hmm. never you're never at a point where you don't have something to learn yeah that's so. very true a good friend of mine Dick Peeper who owned Playgun I think he's 80, he turns 81 this month and he still says the same thing. He's like, yeah. the minute I stop learning, I need to hang it up, you know, cause there's always something yeah. to learn. But, yeah. um, man, I, I saw a quote, you said, um, we built these songs from a lifetime of living them. And, uh, just hearing your stories, just in the short amount of time we talked, you can definitely, you can feel that, you know, there's, it's very authentic, very genuine. Um, so I'm curious though. So if, 
if if somebody gives you let's say i don't know 100 million dollars or let's say your your music career just skyrockets and you're doing the deal you know you're the next chris ledoux um what do you do what do you do tomorrow if you have no worries you don't have to worry about money ever again what is it that that you want to do tomorrow so uh, music will always be a, a big part of it and i always want to be able to share that music with people um but as far as financially, one of my dreams is to be able to help other people through music and through horses. And so one of my dreams is basically to start a, some kind of an equine therapy ranch and, and just be able to provide that space for people who need help to have a connection with horses and make changes in their life. That's something I really, I really want to do sharing horses with the world is something that's always been important to me. And, and to this day, that's exactly what I'd do. I'd, I'd find a way to set up my own ranch and make it to where I can help people. And, and maybe, maybe it's something where it's a whole experience of we get to ride horses and then we come back and we listen to country music. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's great, man. That's really cool to hear. Yeah. Um, knowing what you know now, Chris, if you could go back in time and give that, 20 year old Chris Peterson advice what advice would that be never give up never stop working um and it, it's something I've seen over the course of trying to do this music thing there are, there will always be setbacks there will always be roadblocks things will almost never turn out the way that you want them to or the way that you plan mm -hmm. but if you keep working toward a goal you're going to get closer to it and a lot of times things will turn out even better than you had hoped for or expected through those failures that don't work out. Yeah. Right. Yep. I mean, I, I have countless, countless times when I've, Oh, this is, this is so great. This is going to be the, the, this is going to be our big, our big moment. And it comes and goes. And for some reason, something doesn't work out and, you just wonder why, but then a month down the road, you realize it didn't work out for a reason and you found something better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I talk about that a lot. You know, it's like, yeah, we don't understand why sometimes, and, and maybe we have worked our ass off to get to a certain point. And uh, I think a lot of times it's because we're looking five feet in front of us yeah. you know, when really we need to be looking five miles in front of us. So what I've tried to do in, in my life is just have gratitude for every situation you know, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is. Cause it's just my perception on how I view it anyway. You yeah. Know, so I, I try to just have gratitude because I know everything's happening just as, it's, as it's supposed to. But, um, yeah, that's a good point. Well, man, I got, uh, I got two more questions for you. First one is something I ask everybody that comes on the show. What is your definition of a cowboy? It's, it kind of goes back to, what I was saying earlier, but I think it's something in your soul. It, it's, it's not what boots you wear. Uh, it's in your soul. It's, it's in the fabric of who you are. I think it's more about being genuine. Um, more, more about, I honestly would say more about your inner values and, and your core values in who you are as a human being than what you do or how you dress. Mm, very well articulated. Uh, that may, that may not make any sense at all, but th that's no, kind of perfect sense, man. It's, it's, that's deep, but that's good. That's really good. That's the um, whole, that, that was the whole idea behind that. If you could take a look inside the dashboard of my soul, it, it's, it's that it's, man, you, I, I can't look at somebody and say, you're not a cowboy. Yeah. Yeah. Which you did. I mean, I think you, 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 I somewhat did answer that um, <laughs> before I even asked the question earlier in the show, but um, well, man, I've enjoyed the shit out of, of, of this, um, Chris, really. Um, you're just, you're a genuine guy, very authentic. And, and um, it comes through in your music. It comes through just from talking to you. Um, if folks don't know about you, where can they, um, where can they find out more about Chris Peterson and, and your music? So the, the easiest way, obviously, is the Instagram at diehardcowboy underscore. Um, kind of built my whole page there around that the same idea is horses, cowboy music, um, 
everything that I feel like is important to me. So that's what that's all about. So that's how social media wise you can find me. Um, music wise, you can find my new album on uh, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, Amazon, pretty much anywhere you can find music. You can also go to my website, order a CD, and I can get you an old school copy of a CD. Right on, man. Yeah. Cowboy Coming Home, right? That's the new album. That's right. That's right. Cowboy Coming Home. Yeah. Produced by Trent Wilman. I yeah. uh, co-wrote a bunch of those songs with him. I wrote a few of them uh, on my own before from just my life experience. So, Right on, man. Well, Chris, thank you again for your time, brother. If you ever find yourself in Louisiana, you need to stop by the Hidden Valley Ranch and come see us. All right. I'd love to. Thank you.